swim, bike, run. This is Endurance FM with Graham Brown. The big challenge for us endurance athletes and entrepreneurs is that life sometimes just gets in the way. But how do you do something different? The next story that I want to share here on Endurance FM is the story of a man who wanted to make change. He didn't want to just sit on the couch looking at his mobile phone every day. He wanted to do something, make something out of his passion, cycling. So he starts a cycling clothing brand. How do you do that? How do you source the fabrics from China? How do you build your brand one fan at a time? We're going to find out right here on Endurance FM when I introduce you to Neil Porter from My Bike and I. Endurance FM. Voice of the Endurance Sports Business. Hello and welcome to Endurance FM. We are all about the entrepreneurs of endurance. My name is Graham Brown. Today I want to introduce you to a cycle clothing designer, Instagram model, mailman, entrepreneur, and two-time conqueror of Mont Ventoux. Welcome to the show, Neil Porter. Hi, Graham. How are you? Fantastic. Where are you today, Neil? I'm in Woodley, uh, Greater Manchester, Graham, a tiny little village about two miles outside Stockport. If you blink, you'll miss it. Um, it's actually quite a nice day, believe it or not, in Manchester. Uh, spring has sprung, so yeah, we're looking quite good, blue skies. Fantastic. Well, you're sounding full of energy, and I think we need to put this into context because you're not long back from a pretty brutal climb of Mont Ventoux in the Alps, right? And I think for anybody that doesn't know Mont Ventoux, if you watch the Tour de France, it's one of the iconic climbs when it comes up. Why did you do it? Tell us about it. What do we need to know about Mont Ventoux? Well, Mont Ventoux, I think you hit the nail on the head there, Graham. It's like the sort of World Cup final of cycling. Um, it really is the pinnacle and a very special climb that the tour only do, I think, every maybe four years to keep it so special. Um, it's 21.9 kilometres um, from base to top um, to the viewing tower. Um, it's one of the climbs that Chris Froome attacked on sort of famously in 2013. He, he left the field in his wake. And then, of course, last year uh, he lost his bike, if you remember. Um, yeah. There was a crash and he had to run up the tour and then also more sort of maybe infamously now was the Marco Pantani and Lance Armstrong yeah. back uh, 2006 maybe when they were eyeballs out uh, absolutely powering up the climb um, so we did it last year a group of us who cycle had a bit of a brainwave to go and watch a bit of the tour um, and I think the majority of sort of people will go and watch the finish in Paris Um which, you know, a few of the guys have done, but it, it wasn't really something that particularly interested me. I wanted to do some proper cycle in my level there, and it's probably the, um, the, the hardest thing I've ever done, to be completely honest. So we arranged it. Um, we managed to get a van from my fiancé's brother, an old Volkswagen, um, which goes forever. We packed it full of bikes and kit and all sorts of things. Drove down to Felixstowe, got the Eurostar across, and then we drove all the way down through France, sharing the drive and just real sort of camaraderie of the boys together in the van. So we got to Mont Ventoux about 3 a.m. Um, on the Monday morning. So we set up tent. And then in the next morning, we kind of went for a little cycle in the, around the area. Then we had a couple of days just sort of chilling out on, on the mountain and eating lots of food and having a few beers. And then the reality was we had to do the climb. <laughs> so we had all we had all sort of trained at various levels, I think, Life gets in the way sometimes. I think someone said that to me and best laid plans, you know, Manchester isn't known for its warmer weather. So sometimes it was on the turbo, sometimes it was out on the roads, but didn't really get anywhere near enough training done to do what I was going to do on Bond 2. So we did it and it was, um, it was an amazing experience because the mountain was already full of people who'd come over to watch the tour. So all the campers were there, the, uh, the camper vans, there was people sort of doing the climb. So it was incredibly busy. So you, you sort of got swept along in that, the groups of people doing the climb. Um, it was, I had some dark moments, I'll be completely honest, because I'm not, I'm not built for climbing. Um, I'm about 85 kilograms and like every other sort of, you know, 30 something age guy, probably like one too many beers, one too many burgers, but, um, I, I persevered and kept going and kept going and um, I wasn't prepared at all for how cold it was going to be at the top. You know, I'd read some things online and uh, me being me, I just, oh, I'd be fine, I'd be okay. So, I mean, I had 
had a short sleeve cycling jersey on and bib oh. shorts. Um, and when we came out of the tree line, it was like someone had flicked the switch. So it suddenly went from about 32 degrees, I think, to about 12 degrees. Um, and then if you can remember last year, the tour was cut short right. on the day yeah. because of the 90 kilometre an hour winds. Well, we were the sort of guinea pigs the day before he did that, and it was quite hairy. I mean, I was determined to get to the top, but to the point where I could barely stay on the bike. It was so windy. Um, my feet were frozen, my toes were frozen, my face were frozen. And all the while, all these guys around me were stopping and putting on more layers and hats and gloves, and I was just there. Honestly, this guy, he just he must have thought, this guy is not from this planet. But we persevered and made it to the top, and... One of the sort of things that stick in my head was there was a guy there with an amazing business idea. He just had a stall full of sugary sweets. Yeah. And if you think the cinema is expensive for pick and mix, this was nothing compared to this guy. <laughs> it had kept it market, right? It was just incredible. I mean, I think a bag of cola bottles was about 10 euros, but wow. I, I would have paid any amount of money to get some sugar back in my system. So we, we did that. We filled up on sugary goodness and came back down and then... We camped again that night, and then the next day the tour came up, um, which was unbelievable. And I think to try and sort of explain to non-cyclists, you're actually within touch and distance of of some of the greatest riders in the world. You know, I'll I'll probably never experience going to an FA Cup final or maybe the Ryder Cup or one of those things because of you know the cost, the, the difficulty getting tickets. But this is a free thing that you can go and watch and to see these absolute athletes you know, cruising up a mountain that the day before I was in some very dark places, it, it made me sort of think, wow, the, you know, this is their sort of second week now. This is not just them starting off this morning at the bottom of the hill. They've done 100 kilometres before they got here. Right. And, um, racing. and Yeah, and they're racing, and Quintana was attacking, and Froome was attacking. Um, they weren't just plodding up, you know, having a chat. They were really sort of going for it. So it was an incredible experience. Um, thoroughly enjoyed it, and then that was kind of that was our tour experience last year um, and I think like everyone when you go away on holiday with pals you think well definitely do it again definitely do it again and then say life gets in the way but I was determined to do something again this year whether it be for the tour or the Vuelta or even the Giro d'Italia and I didn't actually ever stop talking about the whole experience to my fiance Jane who's a cycling widow um, she understands my passion for it but she has no interest in doing it she's happy for me to go out and in the cold, horrible morning, she can stay in bed with a cup of tea. Um, so she very kindly for Christmas um, booked us a little trip to Marseille. Um, now, Marseille is an hour and 20 minutes away from Bedouin, which is the town at the bottom of the climb. So we, she told me on Christmas Day, so really train and properly started. And I think a lot of cyclists maybe don't start training until the spring. They kind of write January and February off as a bit of a, well, it's not for me. Um, but I got a turbo trainer, started putting the miles in, and I was out pretty much every available minute I could in the round where I live, which is quite a hilly um, sort of area just outside Manchester, like I say. Um, so I hired a bike from a really great group of guys at the bottom of the mountain, um, France Bike Rentals. So he only opened the week before. Really easy communication with those guys. So it was all plain sailing really, I'd, I'd put the miles in, I got my bike hired and then I got there in the day and the bike hire shop was closed, <laughs> which yeah. was, um, but it was only closed for lunch so it was fine, yeah. so I um, we'd hired a little car so I drove up the mountain to let sort of Jane see where I was going to be going and I think it kind of started to dawn on me, this isn't going to be as easy as I thought, um, we were going up and up and up and up and up and there wasn't any other cyclists on the road and you could notice we feel the temperature dropping even in the car driving up. Right. But thankfully I brought the you know the better kit this time with me. So came back down, got my bike, um and off I went and I, I think I definitely went off too hard at the start. Um I think I bit got a bit carried away thinking, no, I'm you know, I'm like Chris Froome here, I've trained really hard, I'll be up this in no time. And then I think I got to about ten kilometres between sort of ten and thirteen kilometres I was in a really bad place. Um, I just couldn't seem to turn the pedals. But it just took a minute, and I think that's important sometimes that you just kind of stop and have a moment, have a drink, look around, just enjoy the fresh air, and then get going again rather than try and push on through. Because I wasn't racing anybody. Um, I suppose that's the beauty of us amateurs compared to the pros. They just can't stop off the bike and 
and have a drink and a biscuit and, <laughs> and then get going again. Um, so I did it this year um, in hour, one hour and 51 minutes, which was almost an hour quicker than last year. Um, so I'm incredibly sort of wow. proud of that journey that I've been on to do that. Well, that's a good uh, time. I mean, you know, as we discussed earlier, the pros are getting just in under an hour. So yeah, maybe you know that is a, a a pretty decent time for an amateur to get up there, right? Yeah, and I, I think you know I definitely put the the time in this year to train. Um, but I think the big thing for me, Graham, was that if I can do it, anybody can. I mean, a few years ago, I was I was quite overweight. Um, I wasn't eating very well. My job meant I was away from home a lot in hotels, so I was taking the benefit of three course meals three nights a week, which mm. I had absolutely no need of. And then doing absolutely nothing, you know, on the weekend I was kind of coming home and if I was going to a local sort of market and eating more rubbish, that was kind of as much exercise as I was getting. So I think if you if you have a goal and you, and you put your mind to it, you can absolutely achieve it. And I'm already thinking about going again later this year, maybe going for one hour 30, which would be an incredible time. All right, steady on now. <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe next year go under an hour. Oh, yeah, exactly. I don't know at all. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about this moment because you've touched on it already. You've, I mean, the, the Vontu episode is fantastic. I think it sort of embodies a lot of what you've been talking about lead, leading up to this, which is you talked about life getting in the way. And yeah. there was this moment where you decided to do something with your life. So you, you've got this job which is keeping you busy. You're traveling around. You know, you're, you're living out of hotels. You're not living the healthiest of life. And then there's this, you know, this amazing brand which you're creating at the moment, My Bike and I, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And there's this gap in between. Something happened. So what happened? What was the genesis of the idea that you decided, right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to create something. I had, I'd always played football, Graham, back. Um, I moved to Manchester from Northern Ireland uh, 12 years ago. And I'd always played football back sort of home two nights a week, every weekend, since I was a ba- you know, a kid really, up until I left Belfast when I was 26. And I, I sort of played a little on and off here, but because of working in retail, as probably a lot of people know, you know, Saturdays and Sundays, you don't get off very often. And when you do, I don't think you want to go and be standing in a freezing cold pitch with eight players. You know, it's... Um, the older you get, I think the fun goes out of that a little bit. And I thought I'd never fought a love of football, but I did. Um, and then maybe about two years ago, um, maybe just over that, a, a guy who I sort of worked with asked me to come and train with his football team just to see what I thought. And I thought, yeah, that'll be fine. That'll be easy. And I went and it was, it was embarrassing how unfit I was. I mean, really, there was lads sort of going past me that, you know, five, ten years ago, they wouldn't have been on the same pitch as me. And that's because I played to a really good standard. And um, I just I felt so sort of uncomfortable. All the kit was wearing was really tight. <laughs> I, I just thought, you know, why has this happened for someone who was, you know, in, in good condition, who trained, who did a lot on my own, or ran quite a lot to keep fit for the football and uh, any opportunity to go and play some kind of sport, I would have done it. But that just really for the last... Five six years in Manchester took a took a backward step, um, and then I came home and I was sort of thinking, what what could I do to maybe get that fitness back? Because I needed to, I think, for the sake of my own health and just I wasn't happy how I looked. Um, I was definitely clothes were tighter than they should have been. I was going up sizes when I, you know, and I thought that's only going to go one way. I'm going to keep going and going and going, and suddenly I'm going to be shopping in the wrong shops and, you know, maybe but it's not good. Um, so a friend of mine from work um, who did cycle, we, we talked about it now and again, but I, I'd only cycled really as a kid, as probably most people do. They got a bike for Christmas, and but never seriously, never any kind of competitive cycling. Uh, and he talked about cycle to work scheme, which when I looked into, you know, was a really sort of great offering. Um, I know a lot of companies do it now that, you can get a bike and you, you, you sort of pay over 12 months, you get a tax break on it. So it's a really great scheme. So um, I went and got my first bike um, from Decathlon, actually. I had no real idea of what I wanted to get. I didn't really understand carbon and everything that goes with that. And I'd read online again, but I didn't really understand. So they, they were really helpful, the guys. And um, I got my Lycra, which I, I dread to think now how that looked because I was quite a bit bigger back right. then. Yeah. Um, and... 
I went out for a bike ride and I thought, Graham, I'll do I'll do about thirty miles today. You know, that'll be fine, I'll just do that, not a problem. And I think I did three miles. <laughs> and I came back home and I think Jane had to help me take my shoes off. I was in such a bad way. And I, I, that was kind of the moment for me that I thought, This isn't good. You know, I'm it's quite embarrassing really how unfit I am. But I'd I'd bought the bike, so it was kind of I jumped in with it and then I just started to go out on my own. And do some little rides, um, trying to avoid hills. I must stress that. If I could avoid a hill, I would avoid a hill. And, and then I just, you know, I was getting overtaken by people all the time. And it was, I thought I was doing a quite good pace. But just over the last sort of two and a half years, I've really built my fitness up. I've changed bikes a couple of times. I've, I've got more into the sport. I'm, I'm getting Cyclist magazine delivered monthly. I mean, I really am becoming a bit of a, a cycling geek, but I love it. And it's, the, the way I feel now and the way I look now, uh, that's all sort of testament to just about two and a half years of kind of, you know, hard work, but certainly enjoyable work and seeing the results now, it's it's amazing. And I'd sort of say to anyone who doesn't know where to start is mm-hmm. just start, just get on a bike. And if you cycle around your block and it's a mile, well, that's a start. Um, I think there's a really famous sort of phrase by um, Eddie Merck saying it doesn't matter how far you ride, how high you ride, just ride. And that's kind of what I'd encourage all us to do is just get on a bike and go and see and you'll fall in love with it again the way I have and the way it makes you feel and the way you look and you've got more energy. I just feel so much better than that awful sort of moment a few years ago at football where... Red-faced. Yeah, just in a really bad way. And, you know, to be honest, I think people probably laugh at me thinking, this guy never going to be a footballer whenever actually five ten years before that actually could play quite well (laughs) (laughs) well let's take the energy that you had was that sort of a natural marriage between your newfound passion of cycling and your background in retail then to start a cycling clothing company what was the, the idea there well, I think when I, because I've always worked in men's fashion, um, I worked for Top Man for a long time and, and I worked for Selfridges. Um, so I'm sort of, I feel I'm aware of current trends and colours and fabrics and uh, I had a few years actually in a wholesale role as well. So I had quite close contact with factories and understood how they sort of operate in terms of minimums, in terms of lead time, production, everything that goes along with that. So I felt that a lot of the cycling kit that's out there was really quite expensive. Um, like I say, for someone who's just starting off to pay £130 for a jersey for something they don't even know if they're going to stick at, not everyone's got that sort of money to just, you know, not throw away as such, but to just put out onto one jersey and realise after, you know, a few weeks this isn't for me or maybe this jersey isn't the jersey I need. So I was conscious that I wanted to sort of Try and do something that would be a bit fun, but also you're not a, a walking billboard. I think, again, there's a lot of cycling companies that you're absolutely covered in their, their logos. And, again, I want to be a bit more subtle than that. And I think when you look at the tour, I mean, it's just a mishmash of of sponsors and heavily branded. And I think the probably one exception to that is Team Sky, who's kept is super clean and subtle and I think that's why it stands out so much um, and initially I, I'd started off wanting to maybe do some t-shirts because I was living in the northern quarter of Manchester which is kind of known as the hipster area so it's a bit um, a bit shortage if you like on a smaller scale and there's a lot of guys riding bikes up there um, guys like myself with big beards and tattoos and skinny jeans who mm-hmm. um you know, who, who sort of, who cycle, but maybe not so much out on the roads and the countryside, they kind of cycle in their own town to work, etc. And I was keen to sort of try and do something that would make people have a conversation. So my logo, um, I worked with um, my fiance's brother, actually, who was a teacher, and he came up with this idea, and it's resonated really well. It's people have identified with it, which is great. So it is a little symbol to my bike and I. And I, the t-shirts, when I did them initially, I, I sold a few, did a little photo shoot with a few of my pals. And then it kind of started off that people were asking me, are you doing any proper cycling kit? And to be honest, Graham, it's something that I'd, I'd never thought I'd be able to do simply because of I knew the minimums because of working in wholesale were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And 
you might get them for you know a great price, but suddenly three hundred at that price is not a great price for someone who's doing this part time whilst buying a house, you know, whilst every other bill that life throws at you. Um, so I hadn't really thought I could do it. Um, I then started to look into it more, and there's a great website, um, Alibaba.com, yeah. and it kind of matches you up with factories. Um, who can get you what you need. So if you suddenly say your minimum is 10, well, then the guys whose minimum is 5,000, they'll be taken out of the equation. So it really filters you down as to what you need. Um, and I was lucky enough to find a couple of really good suppliers. Um, I'm no designer. You know, I, I've, my background's always been men's fashion, and um, I, I think I, I can't draw. I can certainly, in my head, I've got great ideas, but... And literally, my first sketch was on a you know an A4 piece of paper with some arrows and lines. And I have to say thank you so much to my supplier who kind of understood the madness that I'd sent to her. And we were able to kind of come up with some ideas together. And since that, the relationship's grown. Um, so you went to a supplier on Alibaba. Did you? Yeah. Was it a straightforward process? And for those that don't know, Alibaba is pretty much. A sourcing platform for chi- mostly Chinese manufacturers. Yes, and these are yeah. probably the same factories that are producing Team Sky's kit, anyway, right? Absolutely. So just coming yeah. out of a different line, if not the same line, but with a different brand on it. So yeah. was it a pretty straightforward process? Because I think a lot of people <laughs> thinking about that might sort of be a little bit worried, thinking, "Oh, I don't know about dealing with these yeah. guys. I give them the money, I won't get anything." Talk us yeah. through that. They they couldn't have been more helpful, Graham. To be honest. Um, I think you're absolutely right in what you're saying is that it, all these companies make out of the same factory. You know, there is no special factory for, uh, you know, a Team Sky or whoever that may be. Everyone's pretty much done the same factory. Um, and they, they, they kind of talk you through it. So they, we did a Skype call similar to what we today, and they had emailed me with a size chart, with fabrics available, prices, everything. And we just went through it and we took a couple of hours on the on the Skype. But it really made it super clear to me as to what they need from me, what I need from them. And ultimately, they want to help and, and grow your business. And they understand that, I think one of the guys said to me that every every sort of river starts from a raindrop. And that resonated with me. Do you know what? That's mm-hmm. actually true because... You know, I'm not suddenly going to come in as a small brand and order 5,000 of a jersey. It's just not going to happen. But they understand that if they look after me and they help me along the way, then I'll stick with them. And I have done it. I've been with the same factory for a year since I've started the brand. And, you know, they're they're never going to be able to retire, I think, just yet on the orders I'm putting in. But they're definitely, we're growing together and the relationship's great now. We can you know, just ping an email at sort of five in the morning and I get an answer back within 20 minutes, half an hour. And they know exactly what I want. I can send them images and they, they're so helpful. They really are. And there's no, there's no sort of upselling from those guys. I'm not trying to push you into anything. I think I've worked on the wholesale side with other factories who are very much, oh, we can do this for you at this price if you can just stretch to a bit more. But I'm well aware of my budget constraints and they are. So I think from the off, we've been completely honest with each other. If they suddenly get a big order from someone else, I'll be pushed down the queue, but that's fine. You know, I, I understand that they've they've got a business to run, but it's it's an amazing platform. It really is, and y- you can only sort of you can only be inspired by how helpful these guys are, and you know the quality is absolutely first class. It really is. So you've made your first inquiries you've you've had samples sent you, you've got your first orders how did it feel when you actually got your package back delivered to manchester and you open it up and there's your jerseys in there you know? yeah it was, a, it was a pretty special moment ground to be honest um to sort of see something that i had ultimately you know drew on an a4 piece of paper in in a blue biro and mm. put some lines on and that, and that came back and i think one thing i would say is that you've got to make sure you sort of cover every base because when you buy a jersey from a cycling brand, that's all done for you. So the sleeve is exactly the length it should be for a large. You know, the the sort of the logo is exactly the size it should be. I was sort of thinking, oh, they'll they'll know that. That's that's fine. But if you don't tell people, they won't know. So I was a bit disappointed with the initial sleeves because they weren't 
as kind of tight as it should have been. Hmm. But that was me not telling the the factory. It wasn't them deliberately doing that. They just, you know, I didn't specify. So they thought they'll put the basic sleeve on. So, um, but then one sort of email sorted it all out. So the next time I got a jersey, it was absolutely perfect. So yeah, it felt absolutely amazing. Um, and to sort of photograph it, um, I did a lot of riding it. And a couple of guys, I went for a coffee, just asked me a bit about. Uh, what's that brand and you know that was amazing yeah. I always carry a couple of my business cards with me on a ride and sort of give them out if I see anybody and say look have a look at my site see what you think and yeah it was it was pretty amazing and then within maybe a few days of me posting on Instagram that initial picture uh, a chap in Australia contacted me asked me could he buy a full kit yeah that's great and that was um that was incredible really it was um, that's a good start well let's talk about the marketing side because this is the challenge, isn't it? It's great having a good product, but it's all now about the marketing. Absolutely. How do you get it out there? You don't have the marketing budgets of a, a Rafa or anybody like that. So how are you getting your brand out there? How is how are you getting people to know about my bike and I? I think the the big one for me is Instagram um, because it is absolutely instant now. The pictures are on there. Um, and I'm posting every day. I'm trying to be as consistent, at least one picture a day. Um, and I think it's what I'm trying to make my market around is that it's, it's for everyone. It's not these super fit athletes out on these amazing rides in the Alps with a been photoshopped. It's me. You know, it might be raining in Manchester. The collar might not be sitting exactly as it needs to be sitting, but you can see the kit I'm wearing is, is cool, kind of subtle kit. Um, and ultimately getting the kit on to other people. So it's amazing how many people want stuff for free um, through social media, but who don't actually cycle. So I was prepared a little bit for maybe giving away some pieces of more T-shirts and caps, simply because of cost. I could not afford to give away jerseys because every jersey cost me money. Um, T-shirts and caps do, but much less. Um, but then when I look on people's Instagram and think, you're wearing every single brand, but there's not any picture of you cycling. I want to be, mm. I don't want to be sort of that quick, hot now, cool tomorrow brand that suddenly someone from maybe the only way is Eric's Essex is wearing one of my t-shirts, but they don't cycle. The cycling sort of community don't follow those guys. And it's just not the right way I want to do it. So everyone who, who sort of buys from me, I call them a brand ambassador because that's ultimately what they are. They're wearing my brand and I'm so thankful for that and that you know i do send them all a little personal message to say you know you're supporting an independent this is amazing thank you so much and they all tag me in their pictures i'll then reground them to let other people see that you know what it's not just me kind of hammering on social media about this brand you can see on our website at the bottom we've got ambassadors kind of all throughout the world there's a little map you can kind of see where people are so We've been lucky enough with people in Europe, people in Australia, people in the States, and also the UK. Uh, and those are the guys who, when I get a notification through that someone's tagged you in a picture, the, the sense of sort of pride and it's such a lovely thing that people are wearing your brand and they're proud to wear it and they're proud to kind of put a picture on Instagram wearing your brand. That's, for me, the best market. And when I regram that and people like that, you just think, well, this is, this is my little brand that I've designed in my bedroom and... And it's been worn all over the world. Yeah. It's also interesting that you've mentioned this already. It's a conversation. A brand like yours, it's different. It's different to, you know, the, the traditional cycling brands, if you like. But it's also a conversation starter. And that's why people buy this stuff in a way, isn't it? Because they, you know, people want to make a statement or, you know, they don't want to make a statement with, you know, Telefonica on their yes. jersey or whatever it is. So it's a conversation, whether it's at the coffee shop and somebody sits down and talks to you or somebody grams it on Instagram, whatever it may be. And I think people need to realize that, you know, the jersey itself is really, you know, a, a symbol for that conversation. So that's what people want in this day and age, right, on social media. They want something they can share. And having something different like My Bike and I does that for them. So I'm curious to know what sort of philosophy you have about the brand i mean what is it in your mind and where do you want to take it when i when i first started the brand graham and i i looked at people like vans and people like o'neill who the guys who wear their 
if you like, non kind of competitive kit who skate and who who cycle, um, who surf. When those guys are in, the, you know, in the coffee shop or in the pub or on the street, they're very proud to wear their little Vans T-shirt or their nail T-shirt. I didn't feel with cycling there was a brand doing a similar job. Mm-hmm. So I think that, you know, maybe Rafa or Levi's do a commuter range, which is incredibly expensive. Um, and I commute to work and I don't see anyone wearing these sort of waterproof jeans with neon trim. You know, it's a lovely idea, but it's not, I, I don't honestly think it's kind of, it's, it's going to appeal to many cyclists you know we all cycle in the pouring wind and rain and we're not wearing a Mm. 150 pound polo shirt that's maybe got a bit of neoprene to keep the water off so there isn't a brand i think doing that little subtle logo that people might go oh what's that what's that t-shirt and then that's the conversation starter so everywhere we go on my days off i'm wearing one of my t-shirts and it doesn't it's not heavily branded it's just my little logo in the corner and everywhere we go someone will ask me about the t-shirt and cyclists we love to talk about you know, our achievements, where we've been. Um, when I speak to, you know, cyclists in work in Manchester who come into shop, suddenly the conversation will go on to Von Two, where they've been. And it's that's what I want the brand to be, is a little conversation starter that people are, you know, telling them about where they've been. And ultimately, I want the brand to be for everyone. I think I'm sort of the example of that, that, you know, I, I can't ride every day because... You know, we I work full time. Um, I, I don't live in the south of France for the glorious weather all the time. So there is times where you're on the turbo trainer, but just get out and enjoy it and go for a ride. And my kit, I want everyone to feel they can own a piece of the kit. Well, that be from a t-shirt to a cap to your proper jersey to bib tights. There's something in there for everyone, and just to sort of see people wearing it is is a, is a joy for me. And I, I think a lot of people are getting joy out of my kit because it's. It's different to what's out there. It's not heavily branded, but it's mm. still obvious that it's mine. But the colours, again, I think just going back to my background in sort of men's fashion and retail in general, I can mix colours well. They're not garish. Um, and we've had a great reaction. You know, I think the, the the amount of lads who want a pink cycling kit is unbelievable. Yeah. And, you know, that's something that it, it sort of tickles me because, we don't sell a lot of pink clothing in, in men's fashion and work and self. We just sell a little bit, but every lad wants a bright pink jersey. And right. I think that's sort of testament to the Gero because that's their jersey. And uh, well, I blame that, Marco Pantani for that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, we're back to Von <laughs> 2 again. Hey, I like the idea you mentioned it earlier. Just touch on this briefly that you talked about Vans and O'Neill, who are really, you know, these are grassroots brands. And if you go into that, not extreme sports, but maybe into the surf community as an example, the skate community. And you go to somewhere like the West Coast of the US, there's a real uh, down-to-earth community built around people who've grown up together in that community. You know, the people who own these brands all know each other. They were all surfers from, you know, they they weren't sort of corporates who came into the world. And this is where I suppose you've seen like Nike face a lot of resistance coming in, right? where yes. they've had these really authentic brands. And I suppose when you look at cycling, as you say, there isn't really that sort of grassroots brand on the kind of level that you see on the tour. I mean, we see people like the Raffas and so on. But you don't have those kind of brands that have that real retail presence as well. Because I think of all those O'Neills and Vans and any of those surf brands as well, that, you know, they've all grown up in little stores, you know, with like shop fronts yeah. in you know, Huntington Beach or Dana Point or wherever it is. And that's where yeah. they grew, they've grown up in retail. So I guess, you know, I, I kind of sort of bring this around to you because you've got a retail background. You're building this grassroots brand. There's a sort of a, a gap here in the market. I'm just wondering what you're going to do about filling it. Well, that's, I think that's the dream, Graham, is to, is to fill that gap. Um, when I go in, you know, when I cycle, I call into a lot of cycling shops just to, whether it be pick up an energy bar or just to kind of see what product they're offering and to get an idea of of what I what I see and what I think I could do differently. And the plan for me one day is to have my own cycling sort of coffee shop. Now, people think, oh, they might think of Rafa, but I'm thinking more of it'll be a real one-stop shop for everyone to come to. So the mums after the school run come and grab a coffee. It's not an elitist cycling sort of mm-hmm. shop. 
but it'll have a real mix of products. So I'm working on a little range of product at the minute, which is more far off the bike. So more T-shirt designs, maybe a little sort of uh, rain jacket for, you know, just maybe commuting, but not a proper technique. You could wear it to the, turn to the coffee shop or the pub as well, basically. And I want to create a space that anyone's welcome to come to. Um, it would be a fully flexible space. So we imagine that on an evening, if, say, uh, my fiance Jane, wanted to have a, a yoga night, but well, we could move all the tables back and that can be her space. If someone wants to have maybe a bit of a movie night with the girls and have some wine and things, we can do that as well. So it's not just going to be this cyclist only shop. It's going to be for everyone. And that's that sense of community I want to create that people can come in. Yes, ultimately, we'd like to sell my brand and maybe have a link up with a bike brand that will maybe come in and we can sell their bikes and their components. But it's got to be a space that, people feel really welcome, really very comfortable in. Um, I've just sort of started doing a little bit of work with a really cool cycling shop who just opened outside Manchester. And it's quite interesting, on their Twitter feed last week, they posted about what do you guys want to see more of in a local cycling shop? And the amount of girls who posted to say, female staff. Wow. Uh, and then a few guys said about people who don't judge you regardless of what bike or kit you're wearing. Um, and that I want to kind of break all those barriers. And I know from working in retail that there is a, a, a bit of a snobbery and people won't come into certain shops because of the the persona the staff create or how the store looks. I want to be somewhere for everyone to come and meet and they can just have a nice time while they're there. And we can really sort of get people on board young and they can grow with the brand. So a bit like we're doing now with people who've been with my bike and I since the very start, I'd love nothing more than when eventually I open my own place, if some of those guys can maybe tell their story as to why they got involved with the brand and mm. why they're kind of sticking with it, it would be a lovely kind of thing to do that, I think. Sounds awesome. And it's a big market, as you say, the, the whole local bike store, more sort of like the, I suppose the hobbyist up towards the elite level is very, you know, ingrained in that snobbery. There is that, it, I suppose in a way, that's what people are attracted to in a way. Because, you know, if you are good as an amateur, then you want to have that sense of status as well. That, you know, you're not like everybody else. You, and that's why, you know, have all these kind of hierarchies within bike clubs and so on and all that kind of yes. nonsense. And that puts a lot of people off. You know, I shy away from bike clubs as well because, you know, I don't like all that kind of nonsense that, you know, it's always like being back at school and you've got, you know, the head boy and all this kind of yeah. nonsense. And I didn't like that at school. And I don't like that in bike clubs. And I think for a female looking at that as well, it's even worse because it's yeah. a very alpha male world, isn't it? You Absolutely. Know? And I think that you can really sort of sense that, you know, intimidation almost. And I, I see it in work, you know, from the other side, from guys coming in and suddenly there's half a dozen staff all looking sort of very cool and well-dressed. And I know they're all lovely. They're all great people. But, you know, guys come kind of thinking, oh, my God, I don't know where to start in here. And I think that sometimes the sort of the, the female cyclist as well is a bit intimidated by going into a bike shop because it is still a very alpha male sort of led environment. And I'd love to be the one who can kind of break that down and maybe have maybe have female-only um turbo training evenings maybe have female only um sort of bike repair classes so we can kind of get some girls coming to the shop as and when it opens and and also you know obviously get some female staff working there so that there is a real sort of point of contact for the female side which we might be a little bit scared of coming in but they'll know that they can come to our place and get looked after properly in our little sort of community coffee bike shop if you like hmm. well it sounds like a great dream and it's a dream that I wish you all the best with. And I think that anybody listening to this that thinks they can add some kind of value to Neil's dream, Neil's vision for my bike and I, how do they get in touch with you, Neil? Um, well, I'm on the Instagram as my bike and I, uh, I'm on Twitter as my bike and I, and also my um, email address is neil at my bike and I dot co dot UK. Uh, I'm more than happy to speak to anyone who has got an idea who maybe um, would like to kind of get involved somehow in the brand. I'm I'm not that guy who's, you know, super, super protective. It's my brand, it's my brand, not at all. I'm open to ideas and that's how we kind of 
we all grow and evolve as we listen to other people, fresh ideas. Um, I'm actually doing a little bit of kit for three guys who are cycling Manchester to Amsterdam later this year, and they want something completely different to what I normally do. But that's great. You know, that's a new sort of field for me to go into. It's the new way, the new kit they want. They want new colours. Very different to what I normally do, but I'm happy to kind of speak to anyone. And if anyone takes a little bit of inspiration from what we talked about today, well, then that's amazing. And what I would say to anyone is just give it a try. You know, just get off the sofa, put your phone down, and go and give it a try. Best advice. And I did say at the top of the, the show as well, I think it's worth mentioning that you are the mailman for the company as much as you are the Instagram model as well. If anybody was to go and look at Instagram, pretty much most of the pictures, which aren't retweets of your customers, are pictures of you. And if you look at the My Bike and I website as well, it's a nice website. It's, it's well designed. It's a clean website. It's visually appealing. That's all you. So, I mean, it's kind of hard to imagine from the other side that there's just one guy effectively running the whole show. With, you know, I guess you outsource yeah. a lot as well, but it's you. So... I think people connect with that. People can kind of resonate with that whole story of what you're trying to achieve achieve there, Neil. So thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. And really wish you all the best with my bike and I. And would love to have you back on the show in six months, 12 months down the road. Whether or not that's after another crazy venture up Mont Ventoux or not, well, we live to see that. But it'd be great to have you back on and see where you are with your journey and what the latest is with your project. Share that with us and keep us updated on your adventures. That's Neil Potter, everybody, from My Bike and I. Neil, thanks for joining us on the show today. Thank you, Graham. Have a great day. Thanks very much. Endurance FM, voice of the endurance sport business. Find out more at www.endurancefm.com.